Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be looking at the new direct drive force feedback wheelbase solution from the guys at MSource. We'll be looking at the ET5 kit, which includes the ET5 wheelbase rated at 17 newton meters of torque peak and the FD1 steering wheel. Out of the box, this kit looks professionally finished and like it can deliver the goods. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. Let's take a closer look at this ET5 direct drive force feedback wheelbase from the guys at MSource. Out of the box presents well, no defects anywhere as far as fit and finish, no sharp edges, everything is done quite well. I like what I see when I pulled it right out of the box. Now it is hefty, it comes in at 16 pounds, one and a half ounces, or for everybody else in the world, that's going to be 7.29 kilos. Now this is a 17 newton meter peak torque motor in here. Now there is two different modes. They have a low torque and a high torque mode. So depending on what you want to use, eight newton meters is the low torque mode. But when you go into low torque modes, you just can't expect the same kind of performance out of a motor when it's not operating within its optimal window at 17 newton meter peak or I wouldn't go any less than like 70% on any motor and expect to get the same kind of performance as you are at 70% to 100%. That's something to remember about these motors. You know, they're designed and manufactured to deliver a certain performance within a certain window. A good analogy, I think, is if you have a 500 horsepower motor and I put a fuel map on that that makes it 250 horsepower and I go back out on the track, yeah, it's going to be a pretty crappy ride. <laughs> it just can't deliver the same kind of performance, not just the motor and the torque from the motor, but, you know, the rest of the cars too are going to be lethargic. The rest of the suspension is used to more power and it's, and it's tuned for that. So just keep that in mind when you're buying one of these direct drive wheels. What kind of range are you going to operate it in? You don't want to have to back it off too far. All right. So what else can we talk about here? The dimensions. Okay. 265 millimeters from the back of this casement to the front of the hub. To the flange from the back, we're at 175 millimeters. That's about six and three quarters inches and ten and a half over here. And the height is 110 millimeters or four and a quarter inches. And it's square, so it's the same size all the way around. We have a gold hub in the front. That's going to connect to our wheel back here. We have a hub connector that's connecting to the motor shaft itself. And we can see it's attached or affixed with some set screws. We've got a pair here and a pair there. We have a 12 millimeter flange. And it has M8 holes that are tapped. So no need for a nut on the back. Kind of nice. I like that. The... LED up here is an indicator of motor status, and it goes through different colors depending on what the status is. And yeah, that's pretty much all we can see on the front. You'll notice there's no pins on the front of this as far as transferring the power from the motor to the wheel back there, but it does transfer the power, and it's an inductive electromagnetic coupling system. And it's done a little differently than what we see in some of the other wheels that I've done reviews on coming out of China. The usually the transmitter and receiver coil are inside the hub itself somewhere. And then we've got a wire coming out to the front and that will have some traces on it or pads, whatever, so that the pins in the wheel hub can, they're spring loaded, so they push up against there and that's how they transfer the power. This is a true wireless transfer of power and signal on this setup because this is the coil over here that's doing the transmission. So this is the transmitting coil here, the receiving coil, <laughs> kind of neat the way they did this, I like things the different. There's no pins in here. It's the receiver oil. So, of course, once we attach this to the hub over there, it's going to be very close. And from the inductive conductance, it's going to power this wheel. So, nice to have no connections anywhere you can, right? Contactless. And we'll talk more about the wheel later. All right, let's go around to the back. This has a... Big hub back here. <laughs> Look at this. It's like six USB ports back here. And they are true USB ports. They're not CAN buses. So you can put whatever you want to on these ports back here. I don't know how many you could put in here and still get all the power to everything. So that's, that's another thing. Because I don't know what kind of amperage each port is available on the circuit board. That information is not available. I wouldn't expect it to be. Now over here, we have the DC connector. 
And of course, right above that, because that's where the power comes in, we have the power switch on and off. And over here, we have the USB-B for PC connection, and we have an antenna connector on the back here. Now, another different thing here done than the other two major players that I've reviewed so far from China, SimMagic and Moza, they embed their transceivers for the wireless solution that talks to the wheel up in the flange here. But they've gone a different route, a la SimuCube, if you will. And they're doing it off the back. Now, they do provide you a little antenna here, a little stubby that you just screw onto this. I'm just going to try to get it started here. Which is not as efficient or effective as having, obviously, the shorter wireless path up here with one transceiver in the wheel and over here in the flange. Still works. Semi-cubes work, right? <laughs> so, yeah. A stubby antenna that sits like this, or you could peek it out at the side, I suppose, if you were having any kind of wireless transmission issues. You know, depending on the environments you operate these things in, you can have some issues with wireless. It's not a perfect thing. A direct connected wire is the best way to go, obviously. But yeah, anyway. So that's what you have. What else can we talk about here? I think that pretty much covers it. Let's talk about what comes with it. I got a cord here that is a 220 volt, which won't work. It does have the industry standard IEC C13 connector, but I have plenty of cords laying around there for 110 that will work because they have, again, the IEC connector back here. We have a USB cord, USB-B, USB-A, no gold plating or anything like that. There is a ferrite core embedded in the manufacturing process, not a clip on. Power supply itself, the other side of the cord here. And of course, it has a DC plug for plugging into the back of the case. And we have an embedded ferrite core, a rather large one here. And this is a thick cable. Not that easy to bend. I mean, it's flexible, but it's not real bendy. So it should withstand, I suppose, a lot of stress. And of course, we have a stress relief piece over here. The power supply itself, of course, we have the other end of our IEC C13 connector is coming in at, and this is a switching power supply. So it goes 100 to 240. And that's max input would be two and a half amps. But outputs, what we're really interested in, this gives me an inclination of what the wheel can do. 36 volts, thing here, get up here, you can see it. 36 volts at 10 amps. That's about 360 watts. And we got a little LED, I believe. Yeah, there's a little LED here that's gonna light up once we plug it in. Thought that might be an LED. But it's not. This is a Gojusen. Gojusen? Power supply. What else? That's it. That's all we get with the wheel. And I will be adding the steering wheel into the review later on. But yeah, that pretty much covers everything with the wheelbase itself. Let's take a closer look at this M-Source FD1 steering wheel. This is the one that they sent me with their ET5 and ET3 wheelbases for testing. And yeah. Round wheel, it has a leather grip all the way around. Kind of has a pebble grain to it. See that in the lights. It looks pretty good. Feels good in hand. Nothing to really complain about here. 320 millimeters across here. And the grip itself is 106 millimeters in diameter. So where you're, wherever you grab it at, that's what it'll be. Has some thumb indentations up here. It feels very stiff in hand on the bench. So there's really hardly any flex to this thing at all. In fact, most of the flex might be in the cushioning that's inside of the grip here. So yeah, no complaints there. The stitching, I went all the way around this wheel, checking out the stitching, kind of bright yellow. <laughs> but yeah, there's no defects in it. No thread sticking out, no mist, stitch, things like that. Things that I look for that give me an indication of what kind of quality control they're using in the production of it wheel itself. The spokes here are aluminum and they have that brushed look to them. We had another aluminum cap on top. The spokes themselves are four millimeters thick. The button plate on front, we have carbon fiber that is sitting inside of a, imagine a little lip, recessed lip all the way around the aluminum housing. We'll go to the back in a minute. And we have obviously the controls on the front here. This is a button that has a guard all the way around it. You see those tall guards on the buttons? 
when you push the button, it just feels like a button push. There is no tactile click or anything like that. It just bottoms out. So really nothing special going on there. They don't seem to be moving back and forth much at all. They are lit. You can see these letters on there. They will light up. And we'll see if we can see that once we get to the end of this. The pieces on top, This I like this. As you, if you've ever looked at my other reviews, I really love these seven-way switches. They're calling this a four-way, but it's really one up, down, left, right, and then we have an encoder. It feels very good, actually. This encoder is very tactile. Little teeny indentations, but very tactile when you turn it. And we have a push button. And we have an analog slash button piece here. And this like a hat switch, right? So it just moves around in circles. But it does have a button push to it. And there is a little bit of a tactile feel to that, just like this one up here. Definitely more tactile feel than any of the buttons down here. And this is also a mode selection type thing going on with this and this piece over here, but we'll go through that once we have the wheel mounted and running. Got some LEDs on the top for some RPM indicators. The encoders on the bottom go all the way around. There's no stop points on them. And these actually do have good tactile feedback to it. Good indentations. I mean, you can go to grab this and get two real quick. And note you got two. Or three. So, yeah. This is very tactile. No push button on it. Both of them feel the same. I like a good tight rotary, and that's what these are. So, yeah. I'm just getting too many in... SRG on wheels that they're loose. The shafts are loose. You can move them around. These move a little bit, but you've got to have a little lash in that shaft when it goes into the main housing of the, the rotary down there. But yeah, very tight relative to others that I've had. Yeah, so no complaints there either. Let's look around the back here. All right, so we have an aluminum housing here. Everything is chamfered. Again, no defects in the finish that I can find anywhere. We have shifters and accesses on this. So we can do use a clutch or you can use it for handbrake, whatever you want to, to sign it what you want to in game. The shifters themselves, magnetic, a short pull. That doesn't go very far, but it is tactile. Yeah. Shifters are fine. I would not have any problem using these shifters. Not crazy about when they put the pluses and the minuses in them. It's just a personal thing, though, very subjective. You know, it's aesthetics. <laughs> I don't really see any reason for it. But yeah, there it is. Now, these are three millimeter thick carbon fiber paddles, and they are mounted onto these aluminum, five millimeter thick aluminum arms that are part of the shifter housing itself. This is all aluminum, aluminum here. And we do have some adjustments on each one of these paddles. You can see the slots there. So we can adjust this in or out and you can because they're slots we can actually tilt this a little bit as long as you don't interfere with the clutch paddle on the bottom and if you really want to do something with the tilt you know if you don't use the clutch paddles you can always take them off if you needed to so we have magnet up here for the shifter we have springs in here for the analog axis paddles show you the spring under there pretty simple setup nothing too complicated and I believe these are contactless switches inside of the wheel, but we'll see once we get inside and take a look at them. But yeah, I got no complaints about the way these shifters feel. I could use these all day long. Yeah. Again, these springs in here are not too heavy, and I'm going to have to get in game and use them before I can really make a distinction of whether I think that they're stiff enough. Because, you know, in a clutch release, you want to pop one loose, but one you want to be able to regulate all the way out as you get your second stage of your clutch release. And I found personally a little bit stiffer spring is easier for me to adjust as I'm coming out on the pressure. So it gives me more of a feel what's going on. This is acceptable, but then again, you really won't know until it's mounted. What else can we talk about? Quick release. And this is the, again, NRG type that's going to fit on the front of the wheelbase itself over here. And, of course, inside of here, you see there are no pins. 
like in a lot of these type of wheels, it would transfer the power from the wheelbase over there to the wheel itself. This has instead the inductive electromagnetic coupling system. Electromagnetic coupling, or I just call it coupling. <laughs> so this is the receiver coil in here and the transmitter coils at the very end of the quick release for the wheelbase side. A different way to do it. And again, that makes it contactless also at the same time. Pretty neat. The communication is also wireless. So it'll talk wirelessly to our wheelbase over here. If you saw the wheelbase part of this or segment of this review, you know that. And we also have a USB-C. Gotta love it. Finally getting some USB-Cs out here. And it's not just another mini. <laughs> or micro, rather. Micros. Which are fine. They work. But still, the C is better because you don't have to worry about which way you're turning it. Now... I'm going to do is, and we can use this, the whole wheel through here. This is also firmware updates or upgrades. And we can also use this to run the wheel. If you're having a problem with your wireless environment, then you can off, just go ahead and put the cable in and plug the cable, actually. And you probably saw this if you saw the closer look on the wheelbase into one of these USB ports. So you don't have very far to go with the cable, which is a good thing because the cable's not that long. It's not what I would call long for a, a you know a simulator. I mean, it's not that long. So you probably have to use some kind of an extension. It looks to be about a meter long at that. So that's what I'm going to do now real quick. I'm going to go ahead and turn my this light off. Okay. And then I'm going to plug it in. Let's see if we can see what these lights do when we plug it in, which will be the same thing as if you connect it to the wheelbase itself. Now I got a C cable already hooked up. So I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. And let's see what we get on this thing. There we go. Okay. So it goes through a boot up routine apparently, but then it does not light the lights. It might light them once I have it attached to the wheel, though. It might be because it's not attached to the wheel that they're not going to light up. Who knows how the firmware is written for this? All right, so we'll go ahead and do that one more time. I don't know if you heard that little beep, but it actually has an audible beep. <laughs> All right, go ahead and unplug this. Get our lights back on. And we also get a manual. Manual out here. And it tells you, of course, how you can tune this or what to do as far as setting things up. Decent little manual. It was easy to figure out how we change modes for like buttons and switches on here or what we're doing with the clutches. But we'll cover all that later on when we have it mounted and up and running. So yeah, that's about it for the FD1 wheel from the guys at MSource. Let's take a look inside of this FD1 wheel from the guys at MSource. First, we'll look at the electronics package. It is attached to a two millimeter thick carbon plate. And we have some countersunk holes here on the bottom and on the top up here. And that's for mounting this to our housing over here. We'll take a closer look at that in a minute. Of course, all the buttons and everything are attached to this. And again, soldered to the circuit board. You can see all the pins poking through there and they did their soldering. I looked through the soldering. I couldn't find any defects, anything that would set off alarm bells or anything that would be worth showing you. Say, hey, look at this. And they could have done that better. So everything looks pretty clean there. We have a surface mount USB-C connector and also the reset switch is also circuit mounted. In the middle, we have a plug and that is for the wires that come out of this hub and plug this in and it powers the whole board. And of course, that is the result of the inductive coupling we're using in the system that's in the hub of the wheelbase and the hub or the quick release hub over there on, on the housing and we'll take a look at that again in a, in a minute didn't have any glitches for that so everything worked well uh, it's neat that they have instead of just putting the leds on here and just regular sleeves clear sleeves they have actually alternated between a dark or black sleeve and the clear ones so what that does is it allows these to, these leds to be lit up but there's no light bleed between them because there's a black housing in between each one of the clear ones and even the black ones have a LED in them. So all those are LEDs. 
So it's nice they went the extra mile to do that so they don't get any bleed over. And it also makes the LEDs nice and bright, which they are on this wheel, no doubt. What else can we talk about? Clean looking circuit board. Yeah, I don't have any complaints about that. Well done there. The wire that you see going up here is going up to a plate that has some traces in it. It forms an antenna or functions as an antenna. You can see that there. And as that wire goes back down, it goes over this way. And that's where we hit the transceiver, the wireless transceiver. And I'll kind of tilt this up. You can see it in that way. There we go. So that metal box in there, that's our wireless transceiver. And this antenna is attached to that. And I'll show you this view here, give you a better look at it. You can see it's just a little clip on there. Never had any problems with the wireless, so I really can't complain about this setup. If it, I had glitches or anything, then maybe I could say, well, maybe they should have taken the transceiver and put the antenna on the outside or something. <laughs> but this seems to work quite well. Yeah. So really, yeah, no complaints here. We got a couple of plugs on the sides here, and that's for our shifters over here on each side. That's for the shifter cluster with the clutches. Anything else we want to look at here? I guess that's pretty much it. Again, very clean. Not much. Yeah, I really can't find anything to complain about here. Just professionally done. And of course, it has passed the quality control. See a little green sticker there. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at the housing. And the housing itself has a lip around the perimeter of it. A little indentation there. You guys can see that. And that's where that carbon fiber plate drops down into it and then fits nice and flush with the rest of the plate here. And of course, these are the wires coming from our shifters, our shifter cluster, if you will, because it has a clutch in it also, our analog axes. So you can actually replace these. You can see we have two bolts on the bottom and on the top. You can pull those off and the whole thing will slide out. And you can also unclip the plug in there if you need to. So that's on either side. And of course, this is the receiver coil. Again, we were talking about that magnetic coupling that we're using for inducting a current through this so that we get power to this plug, which again, powers the board. So yeah, uh, we got some nice standoffs machined into this. Very thick. Of course, they're threaded. And this is where the wheel bolts go. And five of these, there's not six, there's only five. Because there's a hole here that's going to the quick release segment back there that's also, again, housing that coil for the magnetic coupling for induction. Yeah, very clean unit here. Really, again, it's hard to find any problems with it. These little holes here are for the carbon fiber. We had the countersunk holes that you saw on that plate, and we have some little teeny screws that go in there that are flatheads, and they go up here also to secure it. So, yeah, not much else to see here. Clean. Yeah. I can't really complain about anything. I don't know about you guys. It's a well-done job here, I think. It's nice and tight. It's kind of a friction fit almost. So it wasn't that easy to get it out, which is always a good thing, I think, as long as it's not glued. <laughs> they have this cover that goes on the top of our plate. You put in two bolts in the plate that go into the housing, and then you put your cover over that and put three more in, or a total of five, so the cover will fit on there like that. That's a nice little beveled unit. It's four millimeters thick, and it's got... It's Kind of like a etching on here. It's not a, a decal or anything as far as the logo. Very clean all the way through. Yeah. And again, another thing I always look at, if you noticed on this, there is no place where they didn't get the coating done. The anodization is nice and uniform throughout the package. Yeah. So I guess that's about it as far as the look inside the wheel itself. Kind of a generic looking wheel once we pull it off. It's a pretty stiff wheel. When I was driving it, I really had no complaints about flex or anything. And even the quick release system that works over there, it was pretty tight also. So I really couldn't get any flex that I could tell was there when I was actually driving this thing. So a nice stiff wheel. There's always going to be some flex here. Once it's mounted, you can take your hand and pull it back and forth. But that's because obviously we have no support for this part of the rim except over here. And yeah, there is a, a radius to it which helps support it a little bit. But still... When you grab it down here in the 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock position, that there's just really no perceived flex in the wheel, except for the grip itself, which has some cushioning in it. All right, so there we have it. The look inside for our FD1 wheel from the guys at M-Source. Now we'll take a look inside of the M-Source ET5 wheel 
and see what we have in here. First, I took the front hub adapter off. And I wanted to show you guys the coil that's in here, the transmission coil. And you can see inside of there, see those bare wires. And of course, each one of those wires is attached to one end of the coil. And of course, that is circling like this inside. And of course, once we put power through this, then we induce a current flow over there on the other side on our wheel that you saw before in the closer look on the wheel. So that's the receiver coil in there. It has a plug on it. So that's how the power gets to it. And we have a plug here. Now I didn't take the hub off. I took it loose. I took this got a couple of set screws in here. Give you a little closer look at that. We got a set of set screws here and here. I did loosen those up. We have a flathead bolt that goes into the shaft. There's actually the shaft sitting right behind this plate here. Now I took that out too, but it's still not budging, which means this is a pressed on hub. Now I could get this off with some effort and get my tools out and take it all the way off. But all you're going to see is a hollow hub basically. And you'll see these wires going back inside of this motor housing somewhere, including some wires for this LED, of course, and going back and coming out the back. And I'll have to see there really we're showing you. So yeah, I just decided leave that alone. <laughs> all right. If it doesn't come off real easy and I just, you know, try to avoid put up my heavy tools on it and try to take it off because it might scar it up and scratch it. And it's like I said, it's something that's can be treacherous when you're taking these things off. So again, it, it's easy to see what's going on here though. So that's why I didn't take it off. All right. So the interesting part really is in the back and this is where the electronics package is. I'm going to spin this around. You can see I have the piece loose already here. And of course we have that USB hub. And by the way, this USB hub, I thought this was just a pass-through hub that would be fed off of this USB port over here. Turns out that, yeah, it's a USB hub, but it only supports certain controllers or peripherals for sim racing, different pedal sets and things like that. And, yeah, you have to have the latest firmware update on this to use, like, a set of Thrustmaster pedals and plug them in through USB here. Really, if you think about it, though, I probably just plug them in at my PC instead of going through here anyway. But yeah, that's the trick here. So when I plugged my regular pedals or something into this, if it and it wasn't supported, then you didn't see it in the software and it didn't work, basically. <laughs> so yeah, have to keep that in mind. So we got our power coming in here. There's our wireless coming in. And of course, we have our power button. So let's go ahead and I'm going to kind of pivot this up out so you can see what's going on inside of here, hopefully. Back here. There's our circuit board. So let me bring this over here like this. Now we have a plug down here that is attaches to the board and keeps me from swiveling out too far. So I'm going to put my fingers in there and gently see if it will come off. I don't want to hurt anything, obviously. There we go. We have this little teeny plug in here. And the interface for it's over there. So now I can swivel this out. First thing we see, of course, is the colored three-phase wires here because this is a three-phase motor. And that's going back into the housing in here and feeding current to the motor. Now the board itself is a very clean looking board. I don't see any anything that sticks out to me that I would, would look like an issue. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, I really don't have any, any problems here. We got some inductors down here and we have our capacitors up here. And of course you see the capacitors are arranged in a pattern here that are right next to where the power comes in, right? So we know that's what, they're smoothing out the power as it comes in. The main chip here, for the position sensor. That's what that little circle is right there. Now this surprised me when I pulled this off. I thought there'd be some kind of an encoder on here. That is an encoder, it's, it's performing the encoder function, but in a different way. So this chip is sensing, there's a magnet on the back of this shaft, on the other end of our electric motor. And you can see right here, there's a little magnet right there on the end of it. I think I have something I could stick to this and see if it, how much of a magnet it is. There you go. You see it kind of snatches it and holds it there. Maybe got something a little smaller that can actually hold. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> anyway, so the magnet is obviously moving. That means the fields of the magnetic field are moving. And our chip over here senses that and adjusting and adjust it accordingly to our wheel position. But because th this wheel is one of the smoothest ones I've had in the SRG as far as around center where I could get it, 
pretty smooth. There's still a little bit of ripple in there, but you really had to feel for it. And yeah, so I was surprised that that's what they have because they, all the other wheels are wheel bases rather that I've had through the SRG that have this type of setup. It was really hard for me to get rid of, try to get rid of that ripple and it was always there. It was noticeable. Um, but then again, you know, it's something you can, you can live with as long as you get the detail of force feedback you want. But I made some comments about that in the live tuning session about what I was feeling and, and things like that. So I was a little bit surprised to see that was the configuration they have up here. Now also we have hidden over here is our little receiver, our transceiver if you're a wireless. See that little green stamp on there? And we have this little black cable coming out. And that little black cable is attached to, it goes out of here and goes around the other side of the board where our wireless connector is, our coaxial connection, right there. So yeah, very neat layout here. I don't see anything here that sticks out to me that would be a problem. Very professionally finished and done. Again, it's a theme with everything that I've gotten from MSource. So they certainly do know what they're doing. So yeah, that's our look inside for the ET5 wheelbase. Now let's look at the optional mounting bracket that you can order with your wheel. It does not come with the wheelbase, but you can get one of these for mounting to a flat surface. So if you don't have a way to front mount this, which would be the optimal way to do that and the way I'm going to be doing it, then yeah, they do make a bracket for it. This is three millimeter thick steel. It has a kind of a sandpaper kind of finish on it. Not really that abrasive, but it just has that texture to it. Oh, well, that's going to show up in the light. Seems to be pretty decent, but this is kind of finishes usually that flake off pretty quick. So be aware. In fact, uh, got a little piece right here that's shiny. Of course, I, I don't know if I did that or it came I probably did that because I've been playing around with it and doing some mounting simulations, see how it, how it all works. So this obviously is going to fit on the front of our motor flange over here. And it has a cutout that will match the raised area of that flange where that LED is sitting over here. So it fits that perfectly. And while I have this up, you can see we have, beside these big mounting holes, we've got these smaller holes for mounting a, I'm guessing a display or something. We have them on the top of the flange. And we have it underneath the bottom there. So this has the holes that will mount up to that. Or give you access to those, even with this mounted. So let's go ahead and slide this on here and see what it looks like. There we go. So yeah, it fits pretty well, you might imagine, because it custom made for their wheel. I'll show you the side piece there. You can see how flush it is. Now, they do give you a hardware kit with this. We've got some M5 bolts, 16 mil long. We've got some M5 bolts that are about 6, 7 mil long. And we have some T-nuts for mounting in profiles. We'll talk about that in a second. We also get some M5 nuts with the locking grooves on them, and that's for the M5 bolts. And we have these M8 bolts, and they give you steel washers, black ones, for mounting the plate itself to the flange on the motor. So it's a complete hardware kit, and you get a couple of these generic looking Allen wrenches. Now, to mount this on something flat, and then we have some side brackets. And I'll show you one up close. Has some flanges over here. And obviously that's for mounting straight down on something, a surface, or a piece of 4080. And I'll show you how that matches up. So you can mount this to a piece of 4080 without too much difficulty. And we have holes on the side over here. This is the pivot hole to change the rake or the angle of your motor. And you can see, instead of just a slot here, they've got individual holes, nine of them. The centers on these holes are six millimeters apart. So that gives you six millimeter adjustment for your rake on every one of these holes. Personally, I like the holes. Some people don't because it takes away some of the minute adjustment you get if it was just a long slot here. But with a long slot here, it also is not as rigid and won't hold as well as it will with these holes like this, as you might imagine. Once you cinch down on this, it, there's no way for it to slip, is there? You can still slip back here, but not up here. Again, it's 
subjective depends on what you think works best for your situation. Now, they do give you these little T-nut pieces here to go onto these 5 millimeter bolts. Now, these are socket head caps for the mounting to whatever you're going to mount it to as far as going through these flanges here. Socket head cap, 16 millimeter. And this little T-nut piece here is supposed to go on that and then rotate in the channel. Now, the only issue with that is if you're going to use a 4080, which is a 40 series, this is not going to work because it just goes in. And if you try to tighten it up, get up front there, you can see it just spins around in there. It really doesn't catch anything. So it's made for a smaller profile. But you can get the same kind of pieces if you need them and you're going to be mounting it to profile for your 40 series profile that you have, or 20 series, or whatever profile you have. As long as they're M5, you don't have to worry about getting the socket head cap bolts for it. All right, so this will mount up like this. I'm going to go ahead and put this on here, even though I'm not going to use this. I'll show you how this is going to work. And you use the short ones for mounting the side pieces to the front mount. So I'm going to go ahead and put one back here in the pivot point. Go ahead and get that one going. And I'll use this M4 X wrench that they provided us. <laughs> if I can keep from slipping. That's why I like using mine. It has rubber handles and things on them. I'm just going to leave that loose. And then I'm going to take another one of these little 6 millimeter socket head caps. And I'm going to put this level. At least what looks level to me. That looks right there. It's going to be level. I'll go ahead and put that one in. Real simple stuff here, obviously. Anybody could do it. Right. So that's what it's going to look like. And again, you can see that once you have this bolt in here, yeah, this thing is has nowhere to move. So it's going to be nice and rigid as far as the rake angle that you're steering with. It'll never move. And, you know, you can tighten down a slot too, pretty tight to where it won't move. But I can take just about any slot I've ever tightened down unless I had some kind of a special fixture on it and move it even though it was real tight because that's just a slot in there at the end of the day but this is going to hold it more securely but then again you're going to lose some of your millimeter by millimeter rake adjustment capabilities so it's always a trade-off huh right so we'll split this over here and yeah this is the way it's supposed to be mounted you can mount it to profile you can mount it to a flat steel plate if you want to or a deck you know a lot of these cockpits come with these steel decks so you can mount it to there but the optimal way is going to be doing a front mount type of wheel mount for your cockpit, and we'll get to that next. I'm going to show you how I'll be mounting this ET5 M source wheelbase to my cockpit. I'm using this bracket here. It's a front mount, which is the way I prefer to mount wheels, motors if I can. And yeah, this has some slots in it. It's kind of a universal setup, so it covers different wheels. It covers a midge. It covers the, let's see, the alphas from SimMagic. The Moses that I've run, yeah, and of course here at the M source, it, all those things will fit on here. And my Cole Morgan is a 92 also as far as the spacing goes, so it's going to fit just like that one does. So one thing to consider here is the bolts that you're going to be using for this. Now, the wheelbase does not come with bolts. You have to source your own. And this is a 15 millimeter thick front plate on here. Now, the flange on the motor itself is 12 millimeters. So I'm going to need at least 27 millimeters to get all the way through the flange, which I don't have to go all the way through. I just like to do that because, yeah, engaging all the flange is what you really want to do because that's why they made the flange that thick. Now going past it with the bolt hanging out the back, no big deal. But you definitely want to engage as much of this flange as you possibly can with your bolt. So this has an M8 size in it, obviously. You may have seen that in a closer look. And we have it threaded. So we don't have to put a nut on the back of our bolt. It'll just thread directly into here, which is going to make it easier to mount. We don't have to mount with two tools, right? So I have these bolts here that I've sourced, and they are 30 millimeters long. So I got head cap, very strong bolts. And yeah, I put a little washer on there just because it doesn't fit real tight in these slots on the front plate. And this just makes sure that I'm covering the top like I want to. So I'm getting maximum grip on the top of the plate. So all I have to do is turn this up like so. And then I'll come in with my front plate. Set it down 
gently on the front of this because I don't want it to scratch the front flange on this motor if at all possible. I do try to take care of my gear every chance I get. And that looks good. Now I'm just going to run these in. Just kind of look down easy enough to see where they are. Get all of these started. And then I'll just kind of run these down. But I'm not going to tighten them all the way up yet because I want to get them centered. Go ahead and just use my fingers to run them down. They're going in real easy. And what I'll do is kind of look straight down on this with these loose. I'm using the slots here. There's a gap in the back of the slot here that I can see. And I'm going to make that gap the same on all four bolts. And that typically will get you centered up where you need to be. So it does slide around a little bit. And that's another reason to have it on the bench. If I had this already mounted and was trying to hold the motor back there with one hand and put my bolts in at the same time, it might be a bit fiddly. Might run into some dramas. All right, so that looks pretty straight to me. I'm also looking at the plate and the body of the motor to make sure it looks squared up as it should. And that's it. Now all I have to do is come back and I'll tighten all these down properly, these bolts, and then it'll be hanging into the front plate. And then I'll just take the whole assembly over to the cockpit and we'll just slide it in to our wheelbase upright. So we already got our T-nuts ready to go and our bolts. So I'll just take it, drop it in and then tighten each side up and we'll come back and see how that went. Here's the final mounting solution for our M-Source ET5 wheel. This is a very solid mount as you might imagine. There is no flex whatsoever in this. I'm going to go over to the back here. We've got all our cables attached power, USB, and of course our antenna. And we do have wireless communication. I didn't plug anything into the USB yet. I'm going to try that later. But yeah, it's good to go. I've already tested it. Yeah, a mount like this being very stiff is what you want. If you're going to spend the money to get a direct drive force feedback wheel or any force feedback wheel for that matter, the stiffer the mount you have, the more you're able to realize what the potential of your motor can deliver. So if I had a flexible mount or something, not a flexible, but something that was uh, not as stiff as this, then you're introducing some flex and that is a damping issue. So it'll actually dampen what the force feedback cues are as far as the power of them and the detail that you get out of it if you don't mount something very stiffly like this. So steering wheel is mounted also. Everything looks good there. Yeah, I've already tested it. It's working fine. No issues anywhere. So yeah. All we have to do now is get in and do our testing. Now we're going to take a look at this M platform application. It's a tuning app for the wheelbase and also does some different adjustments for the steering wheel. Now, when you first open this, it opens to Chinese. And of course, if it's in Chinese, I couldn't understand how to <laughs> get it into English, but I figured it out. But yeah, I'm going to go to simplified Chinese. So this is what it looks like when I first opened it. Everything was in kanji. So yeah, just go up here to this one here where you have to see the bars, pick English, and off you go. Easy enough. Also, there's some other things in here. Auto start with Windows. Don't want that to happen. And UI in appearance as far as small or large. You can go small, but you have to start restart the firmware to do that, or rather the software to do that. I'm going to leave it at medium. Version 07, you can check. So I'm going to check the version and see if there's anything newer. I've already got the latest version, which is always good. And with some information about contact. So I'll get out of the setting tab. Now we'll get down to business. All right. So this is the ET5 motor and it's running 0.16 for the firmware in normal mode. First thing you see up here is steering angle. And that means when we turn the steering wheel, the angle is changing. And yeah, makes sense, right? But we can also set this to a predetermined one or leave it on auto. And there's a, another setting for that later, and we'll see that in a minute here. So, yeah. And then you can center it here. Just center it up where it's centered in the car, and then you hit the center button over here. I'm going to slide this over. So while I'm talking about this, you can see what's going on. We'll slide it back over when I need to change the screen or the what we're looking at here. All right, so you can turn it like that. And that tells you what angle you're doing. All right, so buttons down here. This is a quick place. There's another place for the wheel itself, but you can just check them real quick here so you can push some buttons and make sure everything's working. Shifters, 
uh, clutches will light up over here on this axis up here in the upper right side. We have no USB extensions on, guess why it's not showing anything. Nothing plugged into the USB ports. So again, this is your basic starter mode for the steering wheel. Now I wanna go over and let's get to where you spend most of your time. That is in the force feedback screen. First thing we have is this screen on the top left, and that is kind of a telemetry. It lets you know what the wheel is doing. See, I'm turning the wheel and the blue line is moving. I turn it quick, this moves quick. It goes negative and positive, right? For right and left. And also gives me peak torque numbers, the current torque numbers, and the steering angle. It goes a little straighter than that. Now this, in game, you can use this as some kind of a diagnostics or just give you an idea of what's happening when you're going over a certain part of the track. You can see that these spikes up or down and maybe you, based on that, you might want to use one of the sliders over here to adjust that. I suppose that's what that's for. Now, presets down here, this is where we do all our presets, saving our presets for whatever game you're in. Currently, this defaults apparently to a set of Corsa and an auto setting for a set of Corsa. Now the auto setting down here, we'll cover that first, it's linked right now so that whenever a set of Corsa starts, that this preset will come up. Now you can have different presets in here, so you can pick whichever one you want. So if I'm starting iRacing, then I might have my favorite setting for iRacing, then that would be automatically set up over here. Now you can see in this drop down, they've got different settings here. I can go to Dirt 4 and I'll change the setting We'll go over here to, what is another one? F1, yeah, there we go. So they all change based on what you put them on. I'm going to be doing eye racing, so I'm going to pop up eye racing there. I'm going to turn auto setting off because I usually don't use that function. Here's where we can add a new preset. Press that and you can go. If you made some changes over here on your force feedback settings, then you just label it whatever you want, hit OK, and now you've renamed it. You did not overwrite the one that you have over there. That one's still going to be the same. You just created a new one that should be in the drop downs once you've done that. Here is rename the preset if you want to. So I like this preset, but I don't care if I overwrite it, so I can overwrite it there. Or if it's another preset, do the same thing. Copy the preset to another uh, setting that you want. Or we have over here, paste the presets in where you want. You know, you just delete the whole thing if you want to. Now, this is where you're going to spend most of your time, I suppose. Now, this defaults. Angle range is at 900, or actually it's at auto, but it is 900 if you slide it all the way over here. And you have to turn auto off to do that. So you can manually set it up in here if you want to. So yeah, whatever you want to do there is depending on what car you're driving, or you can do auto and it should pick it up from the game. Maximum torque, you can see it's currently at 10. This is a 17 Newton meter peak torque motor. So I'm going to put that to 17. That's about it. Speed limit, there's no actual descriptions for what this stuff is doing here. Speed limit, I would imagine that's the speed in which the effects come at you or how fast the wheel turns maybe. But it's something that I played with and it feels like to me that it slows down the, the snappiness in the wheel if it's too snappy for you. Right now there is no speed limit, but you can actually take this all the way up to 100. So yeah, what, and I'll talk more about that in the driving segment. Detail enhancer, well, pretty much self-explanatory, I think there. The more you turn this puppy up, the more detail you're going to get. Center spring, again, same thing, return to center. Friction, that's when we're turning it, how much friction we have in that turn. And also, we have damping down here, inherent dampening, which is just another form of damping, obviously. And we can play with that based on what we have up here on the detail enhancer. Remember, it's always a give and take here with force feedback wheels, the more detail you get, the more sharp it's going to feel, more artificial it can feel. So then we come in with damping and we can put some damping to bring it back down to where it feels more analogous to us. But remember, once you put damping in one, of course, it's going to take the detail out. So maybe it's best just to reduce the damping and try it that way. So there's different ways you can get it done. The, let's see, inherited initial, or rather inertia, that's at zero. So no inertia either way. So if you go one way, let's see if I can make this move here. Here we go. Negative or positive. I didn't play much with inertia because it was pretty good for me. But again, we'll talk about the settings. I'll show you settings that I use once I got there. Understeer effect. I really couldn't tell the difference there. I was messing around with this. And if I turn it down to zero, I still felt the understeer effect. I guess 
again, it just amplifies it, and you have to pick which which one you like. I think I just left mine at default. Dynamic damping, I did play a little bit with that because that's not just a flat damping. It's more of a dynamic. So the higher the spikes, the more damping you get. That's my take on it. Uh, in stop strength, I left that at one. That was plenty. These guys down here that are all at 100, these are for games that have in-game effects. And you can control those here based on what the game is sending. iRacing doesn't do that. I don't, don't think EC does that either. They might do it a little bit. I can't remember. I haven't driven in a while. But anyway, I won't be using it because I'm going to be running iRacing. Okay, so let's go back over to miscellaneous for our base. And here we have LED indicators, front and rear. You can change the brightness on them. Let me slide this back over and I can show you my steering wheel here. The front LED, I can just slide this in. A little blue LED. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see, but if it goes all the way off, there you go. So it goes off. So if you you don't want to see the blue LED, you can turn it down. So it doesn't annoy you if it is annoying you. Or you can just turn it all the way off, depending on what you want. It doesn't bother me at all, so I don't care. There's actually an LED on the rear, too, that you can do the same thing, too. You can turn them on and off or make them brighter. Wheelbase buzzer. Now, I've got this all the way up to 30, and I doubt you can hear that because it's really quiet and that's all the way up to 30 and you can do it for force feedback clipping or over rotation but you'd have to have everything off to be able to hear this stuff it's pretty not very loud at all wireless connection this is for your steering wheel remember we're doing wireless communication here there is an auto pairing when you start the app it found my wheel i did not have to do the pairing now some of these selections on here have question marks if you click on the question mark went away there we go it tells you what it does automatic frequency matching technology and this is what you have to do you press and hold the park and the neutral buttons on the steering wheel at the same time for a few seconds you're going to see some blinking leds indicators steering wheels will light up and i'll show you that it does it for any kind of mode setting so i'll show you that in a minute and then click auto pairing and then it's just like pairing something to your phone right your headphone or your uh, earphones whatever you can pair it it does give you an explanation. I didn't have to do that. It did find my wheel. Over here, updates. This is just the different updates you can get for the motor. Uh, update boot. Update the base. Base is currently 0.16. Boot is 1.0. If I click online update for the wheelbase, it actually goes out and says, hey, please update the software before upgrading. <laughs> so I'm not sure what that means. Please update the software before upgrade. So which software? Update the boot. So anyway, that's something that uh, needs a little more explanation, but should be pretty straightforward, I think, once we figure it out. I do know that to do the wheel, you have to have the USB plugged into it and also plugged into the PC because I've already done that. All right, so that's base. Now we'll get to the steering wheel itself. Got more stuff going on here. Back up the system. And you can see this is the FD1 wheel, point zero rather, point one three, and that's the firmware that's currently running. We have steering paddles up here on this window on the left, and that's all about our shifters when they move. And you can see over here in the side that they're moving too, as far as lighting up the buttons rather. Let me go ahead and get this over here so you can see the wheel again. So yeah, whatever we use here, it will reflect just like it did in the wheelbase. And also we have the clutch here, so there's a bite point mode. If I pull in both clutches, the whole thing goes solid. I like one side go and that's the bite and then of course I would just let it out and we can set that differently depending on what we want to do in other words if I have them both down and I let go at 602 I can actually take my little wheel here and change that and get it where I want to remember you can have this app open while you're in the game and just change it as you're watching it and it has some presets too up here F1 GT so forth and so on the steering paddles they can be used for other things so if, right now if i click on axis you can see my left and right gear is still a shifter it doesn't do anything and the left and right clutch are their own axes right so it's really affecting what's going on with the clutch so both of them now are 100 and 100 so i could use this for a handbrake over here or i could use this for a throttle or drive you know if you can't drive with your feet you can actually use these to drive your throttle and brake if you want to we also have a button function on these there's a lot of functionality here. I'm going to turn the button and see what happens. 
Now, when I pull the clutch in, you can see there's a button lighting up down there. See, 21 and 22. And 20 and 19 are still our regular shifters. And they go back to bite point, and then I'm back to the bite point thing, where I can turn both of them on and let one out. So, not bad. As you can do the different functionality of the levers like that. Rotary switches down here. I have this on S pulse. We have three different things you can do. You can do switch. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Put it on switch. And you can see when I did that, the 49 came on. Turn that off. Switch, because that's where it's at. So that is the left rotary. So I'll turn that. And what that does in that mode is it pushes a different button every time you do it, up to a certain amount of buttons. So we got three on the bottom. 11, 12, yeah, got 12. S pulse, where I normally have it, is it will be the same button lighting up, 37 or 38, depending on which way I'm turning it, but it'll be the same one, it's just like incrementing. And that's typically how I use rotaries. We also have an M pulse, and that will do what it did before, select a different, but it just pulse at one time, it won't just turn it on. Those are the different functions of the rotaries. Again, I use S pulse, so I'm gonna leave it on that. Now, we have this analog four-way stick up here. And right now you can see the buttons are lighting up when I use it because I have it in button mode. I'm gonna put it back in axis mode, and now it'll just give me axes. On the X axis, it'll go, it'll give me negative and positive, and so forth and so on. I don't have anything that I can use it for axis or want to use it for an axis in iRacing, so I leave it on button. That gives me four more buttons more buttons the better right then we have our seven way over here and of course our little d-pad up here looking thing and that will light up on that and on the bottom buttons down there show me which ones are blinking and yeah that's going up down and left and right then we have a center one we can push and then of course we have our encoder our rotary function and there will plus or de increase or decrease or just like the encoders are doing so it gives me another coder Got three of them now. So that's how we set up the wheel. Now I'm going to pull this back over. Oh, and also you can calibrate. Another thing about this, before I get away from that, calibration. Now, out of the box, the right-hand shifter was not functioning properly. I would think that you should probably calibrate this thing right out of the box when you first get it. So all you got to do is press this. It's pretty easy. Once you hit calibrate, you can see my white lights went on. And see how they're counting off? I have to push all four controls, left, right shifter, left, right clutch, before they go out. And it'll save that information. So you see what's happening now? Nothing happened? <laughs> Not too happy about that, is it? So let's try it again. And this time we'll go ahead and, and do the shifters and do the clutches. See what happens. Shifters are back. Clutch is back. So that's how you do it. So it's not happy if you don't do something, apparently, while it's uh, counting down. Okay. So I think that pretty much covered it. What else we have over here? Oh, we got LEDs. That's right. The RPM LEDs. Okay. So we can adjust these any way we want to by the RPM number here, right? Like a lot of different softwares do this. We have two-way. I have linear. If I click on linear, it gives me a linear curve this way. So it counts up and then lights up at the end. I can change the colors to whatever I want here which is not bad, huh? So I can actually click on a different color to make the LED any one of these colors or click on one of the colors and then use my RGB setup here to make it a different color. So all these LEDs are multi LED, so we can change the colors on them, pretty cool. So two ways, the way I'm typically running it, or we can customize it and do whatever you want. It lights up all of the little pieces here and we can do what we want. And then you can test it by hitting the test and you can see it's blinking. So everything's working, and we have a brightness set up here. There's also a brightness up here. Let me turn that up. That's pretty bright. Let me turn way down, see if that does anything. It's not as bright, but yeah. And we also have this over here. Let's see if I turn this all the way. Well, I can't do anything with that. Not sure what that... It might be a different brightness setting for the RPM LEDs in-game. All right, so button LED. This is cool, too. All of the lit buttons here, there's six of them, three on each side, P, N, and we have a negative, a plus, and an R on the left. So you can go in and click on this if you want. And I can just double-click this 
do this kind of reddish looking thing and I'll double click that and the P will actually change. Now it's a pink actually. It doesn't really look red to me. I'll go over and do the end and we'll change that to yellow. How about that? Double. Now if I do yellow, I can do yellow like that. Then I can actually change that yellow color by messing with the sliders. I don't like that yellow. I'm just going to double click on that. And once you're done with your sliders, just double click on it and it, it will save that color. Double click that. And you can see now I have a yellow in over here. So again, we can change the colors of the buttons also. Now over here, status LED, that's where the RPMs will light up depending on what's going on. Black flag that lights up a light blue because apparently lighting up black won't do any good, will it? White flag is white, uh, so forth and so on. Blue is blue. Makes sense, right? Red flags, green flags. Also, we got ABS traction control. Uh, DRS, if you're running F1 stuff and you want it to light up for DRS enabled or active. Also, pit limiter, and that's the P. Now, you can't really change. I looked over here. I was playing with this a little bit, and you can't really do anything as far as say, okay, I want the pit limiter to be on N instead of P. Of course, P makes sense, but still. I can't change that. I'm, I'm just looking for different options on what I can and cannot change. So anyway, there's the LEDs, total control of them. And LEDs will also, we got some presets up here for drift or whatever you want to do. Miscellaneous, this is steering wheel buzzer. You might be able to hear this one because it's closer. Anyway, it's just a beep. I have it all the way up. And this is for like when the wheel starts up, things like that. It just beeps. Now I can do the wheel, steering wheel update itself. And that would be check update, but you have to have it plugged in. If you do check update, it'll tell you, please update after connecting. So it wants me to connect first, that's all. All right, so that's about it, I believe. Let's go down to game. Okay. Now here in game, this is where you, these are like presets and right, and of course it defaults to a set of course. I'm going to pick iRacing down here on the side. These are all the games it supports. You see there's a lot of them in here. iRacing, okay. And really all it does is give you a basic setting to configure an eye racing to make the wheel work right. 17 newton meters, which is the Mach force, of course, and then whatever you prefer up here. You know, I usually get it to where it's clipping in the end game and that little uh, clipping force feedback meter they have and leave it at that. You can go in here and can we import a setting? No, I guess not. That's not functional. Telemetry, one more thing. We can turn telemetry on or off. I usually leave it on so I can actually see what the wheel's doing in telemetry. So yeah, I, it defaults to on, so I would just leave that on. So there it is. That is the complete run through on what this thing, as far as the M platform software can do for us. Now all I have to do is get in and I'll be playing with this. And I'll give you guys a screenshot of what I ended up with on my force feedback for this thing. Once I'm in and driving it and finally get it all figured out, give you an idea how it, felt to me and we'll just do that in the driving segment so i'm in i racing at sebring in the ferrari 488 gt3 legacy car and i am in the i'm or m platform and i'm the base tab in force feedback here's all the sliders over here now i have this adjusted i've been driving testing this and messing around with these sliders to see what they do i've been testing it and this is what i ended up with now i'm gonna go ahead and Start doing some running around the track here. Go ahead and get in the car. I have the sound way down so it doesn't interfere with me talking, but it lets me hear the engine a little bit so I can drive properly. All right. Now, out of the box, this configuration was very digital feeling. There was a lot of notchiness around the center, and I've been able to dial a lot of that out with the configuration I have. First thing we'll talk about is the speed slider. Well, first thing, let's talk about maximum torque. When you first start this up, the maximum torque defaults to 10. Obviously, this ET5 has 17 newton meters of peak torque, so we put it on 17. At least we didn't have to press a bunch of tabs or buttons on the lawyer page that are on some of these softwares that come with these wheels to get it to high torque mode. Now, speed limit. First, this comes default at 40. I'm going to put that back up to 40. I think I had it down to 15. It was just a, a ways from 40, huh? And the whole thing for me is, and remember, take all this with a grain of salt, as you should any review that's telling you what something feels like. 
because we're all a little different when it comes to that stuff. All right, so I'm back up to 40 on the speed. And it actually doesn't feel too bad because I got the other stuff adjusted now. It's, it's quicker though. That's what the speed is doing. It just makes it react quicker, the steering wheel. It just feels like it's too snappy, which a little bit too snappy for me as far as, you know, I'm all about immersion and I'm just trying to get it to feel like a car should feel to a certain extent because we are obviously in simulation. Force feedback is very important because we don't have G-force and we use that to tell us what's going on. And there's always a trade-off on this stuff. First off, if you want a lot of detail, that usually brings in some notchy feeling, some digital bumping feeling when you go over bumps. Like if I go over this curb here and drop back off of it, it hits real sharp. Like you were hitting the bump stop on a suspension, which obviously you would not want to do. You'd go back to the garage and they would change that for you if that's what was happening. Unless it was a big bump and they did need to hit the bump stop at that time. But yeah, it's very snappy with the speed up to 40 and that's what it defaulted at. So I turned this back down where I had it to 15 and it slows the wheel down. So it doesn't feel as, as snappy or digital to me. And that's the whole thing. I'm trying to get the wheel to have good force feedback, detail that I want, but at the same time, I want an analog feel to it, like if in a real car. So yeah, that's impossible though to get it perfect. But with a good wheel and good firmware on the wheel and some tuning options that work with it, you can get pretty darn close. And this feels pretty good. See, it slowed the wheel down. It's not as snappy now. It feels more, you know, I keep using the word analogish, but just feels more real life. And you can see <laughs> the, <laughs> the wheel oscillating there, right? Which I can make any wheel do this. But where I have it now, it's going to oscillate if I take my hands off the wheel. The thing is, I never take my hands completely off the wheel when I'm racing. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not checking my cell phone text message when I'm rolling in a race. So <laughs> I've always got at least one hand on. And if one hand, just the weight of my hand is enough to keep it from oscillating, just a touch like this, then that's good. I don't worry about it. Because if you start turning down detail to where it's not going to oscillate at all, then typically you'll end up with yeah, no detail, or not an, enough for me anyway. And again, very subjective stuff. You know, you have to do this for yourself to really figure out what you want and what works for you on the racetrack. But I'm all about, like I said, trying to get it feel as close to, as close as we can to a real car, if that's possible. And that varies with wheelbase to wheelbase. So the ET5 here, also around center, is a big place where you can tell there's a digital feeling. It's like this ripple, cogging, whatever you want to call it, notchiness when we're turning from one side to the other as we're turning through the center there's this like this cogging feeling and when i turned that down to 15 that cogging went down a little bit i mean it's pretty good right now because of some other things that i've done i'm going to talk about here in a second 15 is about right for me but somebody else might get this wheel and get jump right into the simulator and use the wheel and go oh this is terrible you know i gotta have this i gotta have that and that's okay as long as it makes you feel like you're really driving the car, that's all that matters at the end of the day. So, detail enhancer, that was up to, I think it was like up at five, yeah. So I'm going to drive that again with a detail. And of course, detail enhancer, exactly that's what it means. It's going to turn that detail up. And with it, it's going to come cogging. And there it is. <laughs> so, yeah, right around center now, it feels pretty awful. It just feels very, oh, just, yeah, it's like almost vibrations. And yeah, it's totally unacceptable for me, if I can get rid of it, to drive a wheel like this. So that's why you saw it, the detail enhancer was turned down to two. All right, so I still have detail though. But again, others might want more. But now when I did that, oh, it's nice and smooth, or at least as smooth I think as I can get this wheel around center. I mean, I really have to feel for the cogging now. Just by taking that down to two, that's what it eliminated. And it feels much more natural. Like if you were in a real car, you were in, if you have like a sports car in real life and you're driving a car and you do this, it's very smooth, you know, around the center. There's none of this cogging, ripple feeling or notchiness, whatever you want to call it, how you want to describe it. And the bumps are feeling very good on the rumple strips there. So yeah, that's why we have the 
detail enhancer turned down from the default five. Now I'm not sure, again, this is the default configuration that came out of the box with. So, you know, it's all, it's all relative. Center spring is zero and that's the way it came and I left it there. Let me put some spring back in it. And that means it's just going to try to spring back. Wow, you got to move it a long ways just to get one. So we'll just leave it at one and see what that does real quick. Yeah, actually that's very smooth. But I can, the return is now snappier. It wants to come return more. And let's see, it's actually not, um, there we go. It is oscillating now. But again, it just takes a finger to stop it. So it's, it's not like it's terrible. And you can see up here where that oscillation happened on this little force feedback graph. It's kind of cool. You can see what's going on when you're going back and forth. And you can see notchiness if it's in there almost, I imagine. Still feels very good around center. But yeah, the spring, which is the return. So it springs back. That's what spring is. It's not that bad, really. But then again, it's, it's still bringing the, the bumps that I'm feeling here. It's bringing a, a little bit of a digital feel to those bumps. And so that's why I'm going to turn that spring back off. I don't need it. And it still has some spring anyway coming back. You can see it still turns back to center like it should. But that's, yeah, that's why they had it to zero. And now that smoothness is coming back as far as when I'm hitting these bumps. It's not like somebody taking a little metal hammer and banging on the, <laughs> the shaft of the motor and you feel it in your hands. That's what I call a digital feel. It should be a, an impact, but it, you don't want that sharpness. At least I don't. I want it to be smooth. And that's pretty smooth right there. And around center, it's very just a hint. I really got a feel for it, for that notchiness, or cogging, torque ripple, what do you want to call it? All right. So inherent damping. Let's see. I'm going to turn that up to, let me get a few notches of that. We were at 10. Let's go to 15. And that makes sense, right? That's a dampening factor. So that's going to turn some of my detail down. Because now I'm putting damping on top of the detail that I had. And I can feel it right away. In fact, it feels even more notchy around center now. I turned that inherent damping on. That's strange. I thought it would make it less, but it, had, it doesn't. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I can feel it more. The notchiness is definitely more perceivable with that set there. So, yeah. Yeah, we, we don't want it to... Uh... Huh. Let's turn that back down. What was that, 10? Let's see what happens if I go to 5. Cause that's going to mess it up around the center. Not easy to change this probably do it with the keyboard a little easier once you highlighted the, the slider you're on. All right. Yeah, okay. We're, our smoothness is back now. That's, yeah, it's still not quite. That's pretty smooth, actually. I keep changing my mind real quick here as I'm going over different parts of this track. This track has so many different services, so many bumps and things going on that sometimes you'll change your mind. You're in one segment or sector of the track and you like what you're feeling. Then you get to another one. You're going to go, oh, that doesn't feel like I thought it would. But yeah, I can tell right away. Yeah, it's not as much. The detail's still there, but I thought it would be sharper than it is. Oh, there we go. That was a little bit sharp there. Huh. It's still just a little bit too sharp. And we took that down to five. So let's um, I'm gonna put that to eight. Oh, let me just go back to ten because that's where I had it. Oh, come on, there you go. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now we're back. All right. So ten on inherent damping. Initial. Let's see. Inherent inertia is it zero? And inertia is like. To me, I would like to, I would describe it as like the weight of the wheel that you're what you're feeling, as far as when you're turning it, how thick it is, as far as if you're in thick soup or something or lighter soup when you're turning it. That's usually what inertia is all about. It doesn't really affect, and it, it can have some effect on detail. I'm gonna say it doesn't really affect it. It can. That's good bumps coming down the straight here. Still a little bit. 
Yeah, I'd like to see some it's smoother than that. But the center is so smooth. Yeah, I'm real happy with what's going on on the center. Feels very good around the center now. All right. Uh, inertia. I'm not going to mess with that because I know what that is. It just makes the wheel feel heavier when you're trying to turn it. And at 17 newton meters, it's pretty heavy already. So that's good enough for me. Uh, understeer effect. I'm not going to mess with that. Dynamic damping. That was it. I believe the dynamic Damping was also at 5 by default. I'm going to turn that back to 5. I just took a notch out of that. Or it might have been less. And it feels... I put more dynamic damping. So dynamic should mean, well, dynamically, it's damping the wheel. So there's algorithms, the way the firmware is written. It's identifying certain peaks in the wave of the telemetry when we're getting hits on the bumps and things like if I'm going off track and it's got these cutoff filters that will cut those little peaks off depending on how much power is coming into it and it does it dynamically which is not an easy thing to do and dynamic filtering you know is touch and go sometimes <laughs> you know I, I use it on my quads too and the quad damping as far as the motors and stuff they're so noisy we have to use that kind of stuff and notch filters so yeah it's it actually feels not a whole lot different, but a little bit. I'm going to take it back off. It, it almost feels like when I did that, it gave me more of a sharp feeling on the bumps. Back down to four. All right. And this should be about it. Yep. Yep. I can feel it already. Interesting. The dynamic damping bought in more detail, more of a sharp hit if you will so it's overriding some other damping apparently when you put that up to a certain levels it's riding on top of the regular damping what are they calling that inherent damping but yeah this setting i like the wheel the way it feels nice little bump there but it wasn't real sharp but it was a good um good hit on the wheel it was a good power as far as behind the hit. Like if you're hitting with a rubber hammer versus a metal one, I guess. It's probably a poor analogy to use there. But, yeah. You know, all you can do is keep doing this stuff and, and feel what it's doing when you're moving the slider and then decide whether you like it or not. Now, through the bumps on 17, see, that feels pretty good. And it's, it's pretty smooth around center now. Not completely center. I mean, it's not completely smooth around center. I've only been able to get the detail I want and still be very smooth uh, with my uh, Bodner Sim Steering 2 with that 54G Cole Morgan motor. And the motor itself is it has a lot to do with that. It's, it's a very expensive precision servo motor. And you can tell it when you're driving it. But yeah. Still some notchiness there, but much, much, much better than it was on their default configuration. So we know it's capable of giving us a nice smooth ride around center. Still a little... Like I said, you know, it's still a little bit harsh on the bumps, to me anyway. But it's also very definitive on the bumps, so it depends on who you're asking, right? <laughs> Again, very subjective stuff, but this is, this is what I would use to race with. And of course, this configuration would be tweaked when I change tracks or change games, change cars, because some tracks are different than others. If I went to, like, the ring and was driving there, I might change some of the detail a little bit in the way this thing is working because it'll feel better, because it's a smoother, overall smoother track than Sebring. The ring has some very smooth sections in it. So right now, I'm, I'm happy with this, especially around center. That's what's important to me, and then it might not be important to everyone, obviously. But I really like what I'm feeling around center here. I've got a feel for that notchiness, whereas the default configuration, as soon as I grab the wheel, it would hit a bump like a curb here, and, zzz, and I have that notchiness in it, or that ripple effect. So I like what I have here. You guys can see the configuration. That's our live tuning session. Now I'm just going to get in and do some driving and have some fun, and I'll discuss it some more when I'm in that segment. We're at Sebring and iRacing, and I am in the Ferrari 488 GT3 Legacy car. All right, so let's talk about the wheelbase, the torque, and the characteristics. Now I did a live tuning session where I talked a lot about the feeling I was getting from doing different things with the sliders. And I was able to come up with a configuration that was good for me. Now, remember, all this stuff, when it comes to force feedback, 
you know, this very subjective, what somebody likes or doesn't like, because we all feel things a little differently, or we all drive differently. There's other things involved here that might make somebody say, well, geez, Barry, this configuration sucks. <laughs> so you have to remember that you got to get what you like. And the important thing there is you have to have a wheelbase system that gives you enough adjustability that you can get there. But then again, not so much adjustability that you get confused by a thing moving sliders around and then you lost your place because there's so many different things to adjust. So yeah, there's a fine line there. But I was able to come up with a configuration that I actually enjoyed driving with this wheel. And the biggest thing to me was not how much torque it is, 17 newton meters, you know, 15 is probably my minimum to give me an, an enjoyable experience. But yeah, 17 is fine. I usually run probably around 20 on the wheel I normally run all the time, maybe 23, somewhere in there. But depending on the car and track too, that changes it too. Yeah, 17 newton meters plenty, but getting it tuned is something that I wasn't expecting here. The thing that really struck me and caught me off guard was how smooth I could get the center of that wheel to feel as I was turning left and right when you're transitioning through the turns like this turn coming up here. Typically, in this kind of wheel, in, in this type of uh, price point or at this market level, that I get some cogging or ripple or notchiness, I guess is a good way to explain it when you're turning it from side to side at the detail levels that I want. Now, there's always a compromise there too. You keep turning the detail up, then you're going to get more notchiness. You're going to get this, when the bumps hit, they feel like there's a metal hammer in there, you know, slapping on the, <laughs> the motor shaft and instead of like maybe a rubber mallet slapping on it. So it, it gives you a digital feeling. And I'm always looking for something that feels more natural, analogish, as I like to say. Like a real car, in other words. And you're in a real car, you're going down the track, if you're turning through the turns and things, there's no notchiness around the center of the wheel when you're turning it back and forth. Yeah, that's not there. If it is there, then you better go look at your, your steering rack. There's probably something internally wrong with it. So these wheels, these force feedback wheels, tend to do that at certain levels. Um, there's only one motor that I've ever had that never did that to me and, and I could get it to where it just feels completely smooth and natural. And that's a Cole Morgan motor that I use on my, my SS2 system. But then that's another story. But at this price point, I think it does a good job, but it really surprised me how smooth I could get it around, so around the center rather. And yeah, it, it, there's still some notchiness, very faint, but it's still there at the detail level that I want. But yeah, I really enjoyed using this wheel just because of that. That's one of the main things that, you know, if you've never had a wheel that you turn it through the center while you're driving it and it's silky smooth, but you still get all the detail you want and the power to that detail, but it's not all digital feeling, you know, snappy, then yeah, you found the right wheel <laughs> because it's, it's a uh, more fun to use. Basically it feels more realistic. Although we can't be completely realistic because remember we need force feedback. I mean, that's what this is all about without force feedback we can't really tell what the car is doing. We need more information than if you're in a real car because obviously we don't have any G-force, period. There's just no G-force. So we need this force feedback. But again, too much is not good. Not enough is not good. And there's other variables and other effects that happen when we turn up detail or turn down detail. So yeah, it did surprise me about how smooth I could get it around center. That's the biggest thing that struck me about this wheel. But other than that, it did a good job, but there's still some digital artifacts feel in it that almost all motors, just about every motor stuff, like I said, the Cole Morgan always exhibits to me at my detail levels. Turn the detail down and you, you can get rid of some of that, or maybe even all of it, depending on how far you turn it down or put some more damping in it, that kind of thing. So it depends on the user though. So all this is subjective. Take this all with a grain of salt, as you should with any reviewer who's talking about a force feedback feel, because we're all different the way we feel things. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate to you just like somebody's telling you, like I'm telling you now. But I will say this is, I had more fun using this wheel than I have other wheels for a, for a while now, I think, as far as the comfort feeling and feeling more analogish to me. Like I said, it was a great surprise to me that this wheel did that. And I'm not trying to, you know, rave about the wheel. There's other things, you know, the digital stuff still there in the hits. I couldn't get rid of all that. And there's still some faint notchiness if I, you know, I'm feeling for it when I'm turning the wheel. There's still some there. 
but at speed when you're running and running circuits, yeah, it kind of disappears. It's just smooth around the center. And that's really what I look for in a car as far as the wheel goes. And it did that. The steering wheel, let's talk quick about the steering wheel. It did a good job. Everything worked like it should. Uh, it has some good adjustability as far as the LEDs and things like that in it. I could get all the buttons to work just like I wanted to. And the software it allows you to change how a button functions. It changes how the, the paddles, the clutch paddles, I call them. They're really just axis paddles. How it's easy to change those around and make them do what you want them to do. So yeah, everything worked well, except for the right side shifter out of the box. It wasn't working. First, it was working very faintly, and then it just didn't work. I recalibrated it, and you can do a calibration routine. I did that in the software segment. Yeah, it straightened right out up, and it was working fine after that. It's so never had a problem after that either. So in the, the hours that I put on this, and every time I started up, it worked fine. So I recommend if you get a wheel like this, or any wheel that has a calibration routine available to it, just go ahead and do it as soon as you get it. And even if everything seems to be working well, you might as well go ahead and calibrate it. And yeah, so after that, everything was fine. The wheel's stiff enough, not the stiffest wheel in the world, but it not the flexiest wheel either. Some of the wheels I've had are a lot flexier than this thing. But yeah, it's stiff enough to get the job done, especially when you're driving at the nine o'clock, three o'clock position right next to the spokes. The leather is good for skin as far as your hands, bare hands holding it. Not so good with gloves. They got a little slippery on me. So it's better to use hands because I like to wear gloves. They have padding in it and I usually use a leather or suede wheel that's good for gloves as far as grip goes the shifters again very good crisp magnetic shifters and yeah just everything worked the analog hat that's over on the left side of the wheel on the top maybe they could have put another seven way there and that's what i would like to see instead of this even though you can change that to button pushes and other things it's not just an analog axis you can actually in the software change that but still it's not a seven way <laughs> Two seven ways. That's like my minimum that wish list on any steering wheel these days because it gives you 14 moves in just two positions, which is very handy when we're driving in games. So yeah, overall, not much to complain about. The quick release, very stiff, by the way. No flex feel in that when I'm turning hard and I've got the torque all the way up to 17 newton meters. That's the way I always drove it. And yeah, it never felt flexy in hand. Felt like I was getting everything that the motor could give me as far as you know not being loose or have any flex in that quick release segment of it and the nrgs usually are pretty good at that i'm not sure as far as longevity and you know how many hours you put on it they might loosen up later on because it is a ball bearing sitting in a little socket that could wear over time right out of the box it's very tight very stiff and yeah pretty pleased with that so yeah not a lot to say as far as bad about this wheel they just did a good job and at the price point this comes in, I think it's going to be a very competitive wheel with the other players out there.
Final thoughts on the DT5 wheelbase kit from the guys at M-Source. Out of the box, the wheelbase and FD1 steering wheel present as professionally finished products. I could find no defects in part fitment or finish. The ET5 wheelbase has a peak torque rating of 17 newton meters, which should be plenty for most sim racers' needs. The wheelbase hub has a wireless pass-through setup that uses inductive coupling to provide power to the FD1 steering wheel. The data transfer from the button plate to the wheelbase is handled by a 2.4 GHz wireless solution. The back of the wheelbase has ports and connections for the 2.4 GHz antenna, power, and USB connectivity. Also, a power switch. It has a six-port USB configuration that allows you to connect supported controllers to it. The FD1 wheel attaches to the hub with an NRG-style quick release, which provided me with a stiff connection point that displayed no noticeable flex during my testing sessions. The rim on the FD1 also provided a properly stiff feel. The buttons, encoders, and 7-way switch all had a decent feel to them. The encoder's analog 4-way switch and clutch paddles can be programmed for different functionality in the M-Platform tuning application. Even the button LED colors can be changed. The M-Platform app did provide me with enough tuning options to get the force feedback set up to my liking, at least up to the limitations of what the wheelbase can provide. Speaking of which, I can add this wheelbase to my very short list of wheelbases I have tested that is able to give me a smooth feel as I turn right and left around the center of the wheel's rotation at my preferred levels of force feedback detail. Usually, I have to settle for a compromise of more detail and a notchy feeling during wheel rotation or less than desired force feedback detail and a smoother feel during the wheel's rotation. That said, I could still feel a very faint bit of ripple or notchiness around the center, but I had to focus on it to feel it was there. During normal racing pace, it was not noticeable. Also, the ET5 still displayed a bit of digital feel on the suspension when running over larger bumps and curbing, but less than other wheelbases tested with similar specifications. There are several distributors that carry the M-Source line. At the date of this review, I calculated the ET5 with the FD1 steering wheel to be around $1,300 US plus shipping. It's great to see even more direct drive force feedback wheelbase solutions coming available to sim racers. But at the same time, it's becoming even harder to decide which one is right for your particular situation and driving style. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.